Thanks for joining me. This is Plain Spoken. I'm Jeffrey Rickman. I'm the pastor at the Methodist churches in Nowata and Delaware, and I've been starting doing this channel for some time in hopes that I could play a role in equipping conservative Methodists uh, for the present moment. Um, the United Methodist Church has been in an ongoing uh, pattern of, of uh, really pushing conservatives, and in different conferences, things are very different, so I've reported on different conferences. But I also uh, interview people from different conferences uh, about what's going on, and usually it's over the phone, but today uh, Jason Sutphin of the Arkansas Annual Conference uh, was gracious enough to actually drive over and sit with me in the studio. And um, before Jason and I get started, well, Jason, let me just go ahead and say thank you for driving over. I appreciate it. I'm very glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Glad yeah. to be here. I wanted to make sure we did this the best way we can do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the whole, the whole thing that we're trying to do is um, shine a light in a dark place because the reality is conservatives in a lot of annual conferences feel, feel very intimidated, very um, vulnerable. Uh, they feel like they're under threat whenever they speak out boldly and clearly and truthfully. They um, often get their hammer brought down on them. And so I, I started plain spoken partly to just kind of model what it looks like to speak plainly about what's going on. And uh, Jason came across my channel. He gave me a call a few weeks ago and said, hey, uh, we need to speak some truth about Arkansas. Absolutely. And so um, I've, I've spent some time trying to understand what's going on in Arkansas. Uh, my very best video that I've done so far with 21,000 views now was on uh, what happened at the last annual conference. Y'all are gearing up for another annual conference. May 13th. And uh, <laughs> things have not necessarily changed for the better in Arkansas since the fallout of the last annual conference. So we're going to spend hopefully about an hour, hour and a half just talking about the particulars of what's going on on the ground in Arkansas. And our hope is that it's helpful to you if you're in Arkansas, just to know what's going on in other places, but also if you are a United Methodist in other conferences. Uh, it's become very clear to me a lot of people feel isolated. They feel like they don't know what's going on. Here's what's going on in Arkansas. Here's how Jason and his peers are navigating things. So we we don't imagine this is this is not just to be helpful to Arkansas. Right. We hope this is helpful to conservatives all over, uh, so you can discern what your role is in the present moment. So, uh, the, does the framing there feel good to you? Works for me. Um, you know, when I'm talking about Arkansas today, the only request I have is fair. Mm -hmm. The only thing I seek is even. Mm -hmm. Um, our previous bishop, and again, we can get into that as we, as we roll on, believed that fair was the idea that everyone let their emotions speak. Mm -hmm. And that makes boogeymen, that makes villains, that makes hard feelings. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is this shouldn't be this way. Now, there's a lot in the entire Methodist system that shouldn't be this way. Right. But the vote in the pew and the vote that comes into a, a floor fight on the annual conference, annual floor, the floor of the annual conference, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be this way. Right. It should be a discussion. It should be if a supermajority says they wish to leave, why do you want them? Because mm -hmm. they're not staying. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we can get to a lot of those details. Yeah. Well, let, so just so... The I, I want people to feel like they can trust you, and so uh, you and I would both identify as traditionalist Absolutely. conservative. We have a certain hermeneutic as we come to the Bible, and one of the things that you and I would both take very literally would be uh, uh, condemnations of liars. Right. So uh, you and I both believe that, that hellfire and eternal punishment uh, awaits those who speak falsely of others, and so as you're reporting what's going on in Arkansas— uh, you are aware that that there is a consequence if you speak falsely, mislead sure. others, and so that that is weighing upon you as you govern your speech. And so other people can hopefully. Oh, that being said, like, grace, grace, marvelous grace. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent with what you're saying. Okay, okay. So and then um, let's let's start with your uh, track record as a United Methodist pastor. How far do you go back? Let's go. Uh, did you attend seminary? I did. I, I attended uh, Memphis Theological Seminary. I know nothing about them. How would you characterize that? They're seminary? a Cumberland Presbyterian seminary. Um, as with most seminaries, Cumberland Presbyterian is far more conservative and traditional than probably a traditional Methodist would be. Okay. But the seminary has a tendency to be a seminary, which means you bring in seminary professors who bring every 
you know, theological theological perspective known to man, liberation theology, deconstruction theology. I mean, all of these things are they're just reality. Now, what I was told on my first day of seminary was is that, you know, you don't want to be a turtle, which means you don't want to just hide in your own theology. Uh-huh. But the other problem is, and if it's okay, I'll tell a funny story. I uh I have a master's degree in political science. Yeah. Um, for the longest time, God called me into ministry, and I kept saying no because I'm going to be president, and then I'll be the guy you want me to be. And he had a tendency to just keep kicking my tail till I got where I was supposed to be. But as that, I have a master's degree in political science, and when you do that, you have a tendency to uh, argue, to uh-huh. debate openly. Uh-huh. Not as good at it. And I went to seminary with that same attitude. And I'm not lying. People were crying because I spoke my opinion in my way and challenged them on their opinion in their way. And there would be people actually tearing up. And I had a professor kind of lean over to me. And I think this is kind of fitting for this. He kind of leaned over to me that this isn't politics. This is God. Uh And if you're challenging their view, you're challenging their very core on God. And if they're not prepared for that, Mm -hmm. you become the villain really, really fast. Yeah. Tell me there's not parallels in where we are right now to that very statement. Yeah. Yeah. People are taking it real personal. And, um, yeah, you would think that decades of pastoral ministry would equip clergy to swallow their pride and to continue forward uh, lovingly despite feeling personally affronted. But what we're seeing is a lot of the leadership is not used to being challenged and responds poorly to it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, as one who's played a similar role in the denomination to you, I I have to acknowledge there have been times when I've perhaps been harsher than I should have been. But retrospectively, looking back on a lot of times I've offended people, I, I think it's because I've exposed something that they wanted to stay dark. You know, well, There's some truth to that. Here's the thing. There, those who disagree can sincerely disagree. Yeah. But the truth is the truth. Yeah. Because the issue that, for the record, and I've been speaking in churches uh, at disaffiliated mission, mi- meetings for the last four months, and the issue that never seems to get brought up is the issue that got us here in the first place. Because there is no theological issue on the other side, other than be nice. There is no theological issue. Let me make something clear. I started this process. Mm-hmm. Now, I am a conservative person. Sure. But I started this process on the main issue, in my opinion, as moderate. I can, we can deal with the grace of God mm-hmm. with anybody. My sins are no worse then anybody, my sins are no better, no worse than anybody else's. Sure, yeah. But I went to St. Louis, and when I went to St. Louis and seen the people after the traditional general people, conference, general conference in St. Louis, 2019, and I saw the people after the traditional plan had passed sing "Jesus Loves Me," as if the traditional plan doesn't say "Jesus Loves Me." My problem has been and continues to be a change in the language says to not the people in the pews much, but maybe to the world, Mm -hmm. that we publicly state that homosexuality isn't a sin. I got a problem. Right. I have a responsibility to to the people. I have a responsibility to you as a brother Mm -hmm. to say there's lots of sin. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. Yeah. Redemption comes through Jesus Christ. Yeah. If I tell you it isn't and you never seek redemption for it, then it becomes an idol in your life, mm-hmm. and I put it there. Well, yeah, you're accountable. There are going to be people that that come before the judgment seat of Christ, and they're genuinely surprised because they had someone who spoke to them falsely in the name of Christ. Exactly. And uh, we're warned in Ezekiel, isn't it, where uh, if you do not warn the people, their blood is on your hands. Exactly. I mean, again, it's better for a millstone to be tied around your neck than to put a stumbling block before one of these little ones. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so I've come from that perspective. Now, does that mean that where do homosexuals need to be in, on Sundays? Mm-hmm. Church, mm-hmm. along with sinners just like me. Mm-hmm. That's that's how this goes. Mm-hmm. But I can't say, but that's cool and this isn't. Right, yeah. Yeah, the dividing, the dividing point between conservatives and liberals in the United Methodist Church is not who is welcome in the body of Christ. It's... 
um, are we going to compromise the truth of the gospel in order to make people feel affirmed and welcome? But listen to the other side. Mm -hmm. The other side is exactly about who's welcome. The moderates who are into this issue Mm -hmm. are, you know, and the thing is I got pushed to the right because to me it's not a moderate position to say something that Scripture doesn't say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The moderates in this just want to live and let live. And for the record, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. What you do with the truth is your business. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah. I'm going to pray for you that you find the real truth. Mm -hmm. After that, it's not my job to persecute, ridicule, or hurt anybody for any reason. Yeah. Yeah, the left, uh, when they talk about welcoming others, the presupposition is people will not feel welcome or be effectively welcomed if you're speaking to their sin. You need to speak to God's grace and then let them figure out the sin thing on their own. And then someone like me at least would say, no, people are not psychic. Uh, They need to be warned about their sin. They need to be told about specific sins. Um, Otherwise, uh, we're we're teaching people to be complicit in sin, and that that has long-term consequences. So it's not a loving thing not to speak to people about their sin. All sin is idolatry at its base form. All sin is idolatry at its base form. Mm -hmm. I will give everything to Jesus except this. Right, yeah. Whatever this is, is the idol of your life. Yeah. The majority of the time, it's the guy's face I shave in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I'll give everything I have except what I personally want to do and things to this effect. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you break it down this way, there's no minor sin on that scale because it's all about putting something above God. Right, yeah. And, you know, and so if that's the case, then the only truth is the truth. Yeah. I mean, there is no personal truth. There is no my truth. My truth, to me, is an immediate idol that has to be dealt with. If it's true for you and you alone, then what about the truth? Yeah, that for those who confess subjective truth, there is no objective truth. Right. So the two are mutually exclusive. So um, people who stand in the line of traditional Wesleyanism say, no, there's just God and his truth, and that's all. Everything else will be destroyed uh, right. on the last day. So um, you graduated seminary what year? Uh, I was trying to run through that. Uh, my daughter is uh, 16 this year, so 16, it'd be 09. Okay, and so you've been in pastoral ministry since '09. Yes, you got out of. Well, seminary. actually, I was I was in seminary in '07 or so, and uh, for uh, again, I was there about two years. Okay, I went through it pretty quick. I got to a point where I said, "I'll take 18 hours a semester. It's fine <laughs> to get out." Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got out, and you've been in pastoral ministry ever since. How many yeah. appointments have you had? Oh, Lordy. Uh, How many churches have you served? 11. Wow. Now, the so thing you is, is that frequent. I, it's, well, it's not as much moving and frequent as right now I have a three-point charge. Sure, yeah. Uh, I had a one-point charge, a one-point charge, a one-point charge, and then I had um, two two-point charges while I was in seminary. Yeah. So, I mean, again, and then uh, I also served a two-point charge um, pr- prior to the appointment that I served. Okay. So it's not that many appointments, it's that many churches. Sure, So yeah. I did a three-point charge right out of seminary. and Big fun, isn't it? <laughs> I was going, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of time on the road, so. Well, I volunteered for my, did you? to add the third appointment. There wow. was a church struggling down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, DS was a friend of mine, and I said, I can help. And all of a sudden, I'm preaching at 8.30, 9.40, and 11 o'clock on Sunday. So. Oh, my gosh, all three in one morning. Yeah. Wow. But the last one, though, it's a pretty good sermon, so. <laughs> Well, let's talk about Arkansas because um, the way an outsider like me looks at Arkansas is um, when one thinks about the demographics of the state, it would be largely thought of as a conservative red state. But when you look at the behavior of the United Methodist Annual Conference there, it would seem to be quite liberal. As as one who watched some of the deliberation on the floor of the last annual conference that you had, it seemed like um, liberal voices were not just confident there, but they felt entitled to leadership uh, of that. Um, I was genuinely surprised at the dynamic I saw on the floor of annual conference. So um, the impression I have is that the in almost every annual conference, the clergy is more liberal than the people in the pews. I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that 
the vast majority of people in the pews really are conservative and have conservative sensibilities. Um, but it would seem that the, at least the, the administrative structure of the conference and the clergy largely lean left. And then as right-leaning clergy leave, I would assume that that gets worse. Would you? You get you a drink of water because this is yeah. going to take a second. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, going in 2019, uh, we had these open town hall forums. Uh, Bishop Muller decided it would be a good idea to explain and explain and explain the three plans. Um, for general conference. For general conference, general conference, the special conference of 2019. We were supposed to figure out once and for all the sexuality debate where we were yeah. going to stand. There was the one church plan. There was the one that just liberalized the position. I forget what that one was called. Oh, let's see. There's the uh, one uh, one church plan. There was the traditional plan, and then there was the connectional conference plan. Oh, that's right. Now, what you need to understand is is that my bishop was in charge of presenting the connectional conference plan. Okay. Now, the reason you don't know it is is it died 15 minutes into the special session. Mm-hmm. Nobody looked at that as, as something. A real go. option, yeah. But in doing that, he had us go to town halls. He had us go to uh, these meetings. And basically, he had a general poll of the people in the pews. The people in the pews, over 80%. Supported the traditional plan. Yeah. And the people in the pews, over 80% supported the traditional plan. Mm-hmm. That was with the most liberal uh, district being concluded in, and that would be the central district. Yeah, with Little Rock, yeah. S- yeah, the central district had 67%. Still majority. For the conservative traditional plan. Super majority, yeah. Right. It's still super majority. Yeah. And... So that's where we were. Mm-hmm. And then we went to 2019. Now, prior to this, you got to understand that there has been, this will be my 20th year in ministry this um, this July, when I count student pastor and things as a mm-hmm. fact. Yeah. 20th year in ministry this July. For 15 years, we were as cordial as any conference you could find. Yeah. And then the drift started. I argued this on Sunday that, you know, that, there's a belief that there's a natural bell curve to these things, that there is a natural left and right on the extremes and everyone else is in the middle. Well, what happened about 2015 is that that middle was pushed downward, and now you have a right and a left, and that switches back and forth at about a 48 to 52% clip. That's on the clergy side. Well, that's on the clergy side, but there's also is on the conference side. The delegates that come are usually picked by the clergy who are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's the delegates. It's on the floor of annual conference. It sways from about 52 to 48. That's what was the case. Mm-hmm. We went into 2020 elections trying to maintain that balance. But after 2019, the left became very organized in Arkansas mm-hmm. and decided that um, they were going to have a clean slate. Yeah. And they did at about 51 to 48 to 46% kind, yeah. of, kind of range. Yeah. Well, now Arkansas has the most progressive delegation you could come up with. They have one centrist on the, or maybe two centrists on the whole block. Mm-hmm. Well, there's nothing a conservative who represents the majority of the church can do. Yeah. There, the liberals started winning, and they really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Winning's fun. Winning's fun. Yeah. And they really enjoyed it. Now, what happens is, and it's okay. Is it okay for me to go into disaffiliation now? Or sure. Right. Yeah. What happens is, is that now churches have an individual choice, mm-hmm. and whether they believe it or if they've told it to themselves enough that they believe it is that there became a fairly strong liberal stay side in Arkansas. They have their own page, uh-huh. a page I've been blocked from twice. <laughs> I'm just asking questions. They like their echo chamber very much in Arkansas. And they saw churches that had some, you know, clout in the conference go through the disaffiliation process. Mm-hmm. And they didn't like it. 
And what they did was they united. We're talking about like Jonesboro? Jonesboro, Cabot, Searcy. Yeah, those were the three that got shut down. And they all had clout before that, you said? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, again, Cabot was probably the smallest of those three. And we'll get into what happened on the floor in a little bit. But it was an idea that um, we can, as a group, since we can win on the floor of the annual conference, we can win on the floor of a special session of the annual conference. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that you're not going to win. So what I anticipate you mean by that is they won. They kept three churches from leaving that wanted to leave, but still it's still left. a loss for them. Yeah, there, there's and it's lawsuits. financial, right? Again, maybe we need to. That needs to probably put a comma in that and go down the road. Okay. Arkansas came in there with an idea that said that we're going to be organized and structurally ready, and we will go in the floor and we will win this fight too. Now, Jeff, to be honest with you, I was, there's a large part of my life during this process. I said, the world needs Jeremiah's too. Mm -hmm. I'll stay and be a Jeremiah. And for biblically illiterate people, that means crying out in the public square. We've very, messed up. This is a mistake. Yeah. We need to, to repent and be different and things this effect. I mean, I'd been preparing that for two years. Mm -hmm. It was the actions on the floor of the annual conference that made me say, no, there is no... There is no, there is no big tent. There is no safe space. You're talking about just at the annual conference last year, right? That's when you in got November very clear. of last year. Okay. There is no. I mean, June when they decided to uh, torpedo a um, a bipartisan effort to come up with an easier disaffiliation plan. There was I, a proposal right. to make it easier, and the left leaning who, delegates all said no. Who agreed to the proposal? Even the ones who agreed to it initially turned. They didn't want to openly defeat it, so they tabled it. When I saw that, then I understood that this stopped so is being it, in the realm of Christ and this started being in the realm of the political. Since it was tabled, is it going to come up at this upcoming annual conference? It, it was supposed to come up in 2019, but the Judicial Council ruled it out of favor anyway. Oh, wait. You're, I thought you were talking about it uh, uh Last year's annual conference, they tabled something that would... Yeah, it would have been June's annual conference, not the special session. Right, right. yeah. So they tabled it in June of last year, so it should come up. Is your next conference in June? The, well, the... They, they brought it back up on the floor in November. And oh, did they? pretty much At ruled it out conference? of order. Okay, so it's it's dead now. It's, it's dead, not going to come yeah. back up. Okay. But they didn't have to kill it. They tabled it. And I yeah. saw the actions of how they were doing it to table it. Sure. And I warned every conservative that I could find. They're going to vote against you. Okay. Now, one of the reasons I called you up yeah. <laughs> is because you are honest about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem we have as conservatives is the conservatives don't want this fight. They have no desire for it. Yeah. I don't want it. Yeah. But it doesn't change the fact that it has to happen. Mm -hmm. There's been an attitude of, please don't beat me. Mm -hmm. I'll be quiet. I'll be still. Please don't beat me. Please don't hurt me. And as I'm saying this to folks, this has a tendency to people like, no, they're better than this. No. And I'm just saying, look at the state page. They're spending money on ads in Jonesboro to stop this. They uh -oh. put ads in a newspaper. I never saw that. To stop this. Okay. They were not going to just let it go. Yeah, I just repeat, reported on uh, Shreveport um, first. They put ads on TV, mm. professional quality ads, uh, publicly just announcing that this was going to be the hateful church if they voted the wrong way. Right. Yeah, so they, they tried to torpedo the vote that way, but you're saying the stay page, uh, the stay movement in uh, Arkansas is well-funded, and they've also been happy to, to air your dirty That's laundry. That's where Shreveport got the idea, I have a feeling. Okay. They put it in the main paper in Jonesboro, full page ad about how this was going, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. The day of the vote, and I wasn't I wasn't allowed to uh, to be part of the day of the vote, but the day of the vote in Jonesboro, they had the police there. They they expected there to be an issue. Yeah. Wow. 
Now, again, they also need traffic control if you know Jonesboro downtown. Sure. But okay. it, it was just one of those things of this was a very heated thing, mm -hmm. and a very organized and angry group was formed that are still there working against disaffiliations to this day. At Jonesboro. At Jonesboro, but that Jonesboro group became the Arkansas Staying United Facebook page. Okay. We get to, two down, we get to November 19th. The first red flag of the day is we're going to vote on everybody over 85% together. Right, yeah, yeah. The discipline doesn't say 85%. It shouldn't demand 85% because 67% is a, is a majority. super majority. Yeah. The, this is, I mean, the super majority of the church said we wish to disaffiliate. Well, what they started was the argument that said, well, they didn't get enough votes over 67%. Right, yeah. Again, that was wrong, but it was allowed. I think your conference was the only conference that had done that at that point. Still the only conference that had done that. I know you had some issues in Oklahoma, but... Yeah, it you know, was on a different... different. Uh, it was that four supposedly didn't complete their paperwork totally. But that's so. a paperwork issue. Yeah. That's within the call yeah. of the conference. Yeah. This was not in the call of yeah, the you're conference. Yeah, right. you're right. This was 80% because we arbitrarily say that. And the other side is, is that um, they feel... The, those on the stay side felt that they could have a better shake if they just said, you know... We'll be magnanimous. Mm -hmm. We'll let all these little churches go. Yeah, yeah. Because the other side is, is if you're a church of any side, you know, of any if, size, any size. Excuse me. I mean, a church of any size. You know, you can't get four to five people to agree with anything. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. You get enough people there. I, I heard a comedian one time said that, you know, you can load. Um, 300 Japanese people into one subway car mm -hmm. and you can't get five random Americans to agree on pizza toppings. And that's just a difference in the culture. Well, to and be this fair, is the thing is that that's the, that's the way it is, is that if you have a larger congregation, 80% is dang near impossible. Well, we had the two biggest churches in our annual conference in Oklahoma voted to leave. First one was Asbury. Several thousand. I mean, it was, it was our biggest one. They voted by ninety-eight percent. I want to say to leave. Right. St. Luke's in Oklahoma City, a generally liberal centrist congregation, voted by ninety-four percent to leave just last year. But that was because, um, for decades, these churches had centered around a personality of a head pastor who right. guided them, and they trusted their head pastor. And he created each in each case the pastor and the pastoral leadership created a very clear consensus before the vote came. Whereas most large churches have tried to take a middle of the road approach where people on both sides can feel validated. Right. And when you've done that, then you're going to find people on both sides of the road cohabitating under the same big tent, which you then find is uh, kind of a circus. Whenever you got to go one way or the other. Right. So I mean, in the, yeah. the but again. You know, if you want to call into one of the issues of the United Methodist Church that have nothing to do with this is there are two systems in the same deal. We all say we're connectional yeah. unless you're Adam Hamilton. Okay. <laughs> if you, unless you're the pastor of St. Luke's, who is the pastor at St. Luke's? His name was uh, Dr. Bob Long. I met, I was in a uh, Connected in Christ group with him, and he'd been there since Shep was a pup, and he's long since dead. <laughs> I mean, this, that's the thing is that there is there is there is a uh, a largest church and then there's everybody else <laughs> and if you're in a connectional system when you're part of the everybody else and you have a church of three to five hundred mm -hmm. you're going to get 15 percent to say no yeah i mean that's just that's just a natural habitat of how it's going to be yeah but anyway so the first action was we're going to split the vote mm -hmm. now here are some of the wonderful arguments that were made of why we shouldn't just have a block vote well, I came all this way. Nice. Sure. That's it. Yeah, I came for a fight. Let's have a fight. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that not even I came for a fight. It's that I drove four hours to be here. Yeah. This is, what a waste of my time if we just did Rubber what we were it. supposed to do. Yeah. Again, 
I wish, actually, I pray for better arguments on the other side sometimes, for the record. But that was the main one. Yeah. We can't do that. Well, the and way we they have said some it, questions about these others. Yeah, the way they said it in Oklahoma was uh, the Oklahoma – the conference, we're, we're a council that has business to do. Let's do the business. Right. Let's do what we're here to do. Uh, are we just here to rubber stamp it, or are we here to actually review the work of the Board of Trustees? Let's review it. I'm actually sympathetic – to that when there is a reason for it. But what reason would there be for scrutinizing the work of the Board of Trustees? Do you think that they've been dishonest or corrupt in their practices? Do you think that – well, what they did end up inferring in Arkansas was that the process, at least in Jonesboro, that's the part that I saw, had not been overseen by the DS and trustees well, that there were a bunch of shenanigans that took place that shouldn't have didn't have any names attached, didn't have much specifics attached, but they aired it on the floor of annual well, let, conference. Let me get there. I'm jumping ahead, yeah, aren't yeah, I? Yeah, bit. yeah. So anyway, we go there, and it's rolling right along. I mean, again, now, I say it's rolling right along. There's 30% of Arkansas that if everybody in a community, not just a church, mm -hmm. signed a piece of paper and said, we want to leave the United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. 25 to 30% would vote no. No matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. No matter what. Mm -hmm. So we're rolling wrong relatively smooth. Mm -hmm. Now, in when we when we got to Cabot, now when I say relatively smooth, we met in an offshoot of the building we normally meet in for annual conference. This was just a conference room connected to the Hot Springs Convention Center. We want to be thorough and electronic and things to this effect, but the electronics stopped working. So we've had been having stand-up votes kind of by the, tell the tellers. Mm -hmm. And it's been fairly consistent again and again and again. Finally, they believe that they have the electronics figured out. There were some churches that were larger that got through, but got through at a number about 44 to 56, something like that. Mm -hmm on the, the ones that I would say there's going to be a fight. But to be honest, it was fairly peaceful. The electronics got fo fixed. We voted on Cabot. And somewhere, 125 votes flipped. Huh. Just flipped. So 125 votes that had been voting for churches to be allowed to disaffiliate suddenly were voting against Cabot. Suddenly voting against Cabot. And it only showed up. Once we got the electronics going. So to your mind, was the conference uh, delegations, delegates wanting to hold on to larger churches with clout? Or do you think there was something wrong with the electronic voting system? There was a consistent problem with electronic voting system, but I'm not, I'm not here to – there was no – I don't dispute anything irregular happening. You're not it just alleging. Was, right. It okay. was just not working, and then something happened. Okay. And in that one vote, the bishop, who, again, I like Bishop Muller. I think he's a good guy. I think he did the best he could. There was no seminary class or bishop school to say this is how you handle a special session. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not doing it. I disagree, but I'm not trying to make this personal. Sure. But when that happened, he got up and ruled that we believe the electronic vote was correct. He didn't test it with a stand-up vote. Mm -hmm. He just said, I think this is the way it was. Okay. Well, I mean, I'd been speaking on behalf of disaffiliated churches for a while, but that, that moment I got up and I appealed the decision of the chair. We decided we'd have Robert's Rules of Order, and so I had a decision to, okay, I will appeal the decision of the chair. Well, I don't know if it's in your conference, but if you make a statement, anybody says anything against the bishop or anything, yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, what I was doing was trying to give Bishop Muller an out. Because if you don't have that decision, then then the then keeping Cabot was an arbitrary one man decision. Yeah. I got up, I said my piece, I basically said, just let's do this stand up vote one time, make sure we're where we're at, things this effect. And then I had five people get up, well, three people, and some of them very close friends of mine decided that, that I was being an irrational Trump voter. And that um 
that this was ridiculous, so forth and so on, and my motion failed. Okay. Then we noticed that if this was legitimate, and we had to hang out for a minute to find out if it was legitimate, mm-hmm. Jonesboro and Cersei don't have a chance. Right. This is, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some of the folks on the floor. On the stay side, they would bring out anonymous emails and read them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the floor. Yeah. You know, ghosts. All it was, was about was a ghost. It was about the ghost of Christmas. Literally, Christmas is past. I remember when I went to Christmas Eve at this church. So yeah, forth, so a lot of it was sentimental. It was, I can't absolutely. say goodbye to this church because of memories I have here. Right. Yeah. The argument was never made. Well, the last time I checked, there's still going to be a church, and they're still going to have Christmas Eve, and they're still going to have colors and liturgical seasons and all that other stuff. Yeah. But at no point did the bishop step in and say no. At no point did the bishop say that the vote of this is supposed to be about the paperwork that was put together Mm -hmm. and that deal. You talk about Jonesboro. They put up a lot of shady stuff about what the senior pastor had done Mm -hmm. and proved none of it. Yeah. And they never went to the district superintendent and said, did you see any evidence of this? Yeah. And they never went to the trustees and said, why did you approve it to this point? If this was really a question. Yeah. Because it wasn't about any of those things. Yeah. It was about spite. Well, and this whole time you had an organized stay UMC group in matching T-shirts around the periphery of the voting delegates. Red T-shirt, red shirts in the back from Jonesboro. Yeah. The one that got me, this is the one that got me. The division that was there, and I say this as a pastor of 20 years. They got up and started talking against Breaking Bonds Ministry. It's a recovering ministry, yeah. recovery ministry yeah. that happens in Jonesboro. And those people found Jesus in this church, yeah. and then they were willing to become members of right. this church. Yeah. What a shocker. Yeah. I'll be down. Yeah. They became members. Yeah. Through COVID, you couldn't baptize. We were shut up tight as a drum, another argument for another day. So one day he baptized 75 people. Mm-hmm. Well, they all became members. Yeah. Well, of course, if he's the boogeyman, yeah, he did that specifically for that vote. For that vote. Yeah. He took advantage of vulnerable addicts. I think I remember the phrase being, "These are vulnerable people that he cajoled into uh, voting the way he wanted." Now, Jeff, and again, I'm not here to bash, but think of it in terms of this: if you're an addict, mm-hmm. you're trying to get your life together. Mm-hmm trying to get back on track, things this fake. Can you take the time to drive two hours away to hang out at a convention center and bring your red shirt and sit in the back? And answer that would probably be no. Right. Yeah. But who could? The country club members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hoi polloi who are the real members so of the Methodist church. Something that I, I do think I would, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what is useful to say for people in other contexts, other annual conferences. And I do think that much of the the anxiety of the present moment does map onto class in uh, the denomination. It's the, it's the upper class, elite uh, class that generally leans left, generally has the money, generally holds the levers of power. Then it's the conservative ones are generally lower income, right. generally not as educated or not as educated in a formal sense. And generally um, uh, don't have time or energy for fighting the way that the upper class does in these areas. They came to Jesus mm-hmm. because they had a moment when Christ stepped into their life through prevenient grace and their world was made better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is a generality, okay? Sure, yeah. There are also those who were born American, Methodist, and Christian. They've been here the whole time. Right, yeah. And there is where we run into the issue. The other issue we have is that we are the most educated clergy. Methodists are. Really? Yeah. I mean, statistically, mainline denomination, Catholics got Okay, I was going to say, yeah. yeah wrong mainline Catholic. denomination, we are the most educated clergy. Huh. And we like that. Uh-huh. We're proud of that. We're proud of our seminaries, and we're proud of our everything and we are intellectual we need to be better we need to be the intellectual better sure yeah we need to be the intellectual better 
one of the things that happened after this meeting was is there was a new verb created, Arkansas. Okay. And it came, showed up on Twitter and it went through other conferences. I'm certain some of your viewers have seen and heard that word. Hmm. Those who were the intellectual betters didn't like that because they were doing the true work. Sure. Yeah, they're the good guys. And they're the good guys. They're on the right side of history. People like me, they're on the right they're perfect. Yeah. They're on the right side of history. Eventually, we'll all just come together on this issue, so forth and so on. Yeah. I will not. You I and will. I are just troglodytes. Right. They're right. going to drag us kicking and screaming into the future. Right. Um, or they'll get rid of us anyway. Well, yeah. The, yeah. So much of the rhetoric is, fine, you can leave, but your buildings belong to us. You mm -hmm. know, move along. Well, I've actually seen on that state page an argument made that the trust clause was created by Wesley to uphold, which is the truth, to uphold the Methodist standard. Mm -hmm. Well, if we were holding up the Methodist standard in the first place, we wouldn't be here. Right, yeah. But yeah. now the trust yeah. clause, not, now the book of discipline is the standard. Now all this, when we have other things going on, and again, I apologize, I'll, I'll lower it down a little bit, <laughs> but now we're going to be the big sticklers to the discipline. Now we're going to uphold all that. We're not going to uphold the theology, but we're going to hold up who owns the building, by golly. Sure. Well, for them, it's more about – I don't even think it is about the Book of Discipline for them. Like if you look at um, what's going on with Bishop Carcanio right now, I, I just reported recently, um, those in her jurisdiction don't really care what's in the Book of Discipline. They only cite that whenever it's on their side. Exactly. But there's a whole group of people that they don't want the case to move forward, and they're saying – we don't care what's in the Book of Discipline. You know, we're victims in this way, you're victims in that way. Well, this group of victims says the opposite of you, and there's this oppression Olympics going on. So I, I don't think that the left generally cares what's in the Book of Discipline. I think they care about consensus opinion among the uh, elite class. Right. So if there is a consensus opinion for them, then going against the Book of Discipline is is not just okay, but it's morally praiseworthy. But if, if what they want is already in the Book of Discipline. And they are then, the biggest discipline yeah. particulars the world has ever They'll seen. use it. They'll use right. it. Uh, and, you know, God help us. You know, conservatives can be can be hypocrites as well. I would like to think that we have more guardrails in place to name that and, and end that whenever we see it. But generally speaking, I do feel like this is a one side. I don't really do the both sides thing very much with this particular issue. I think conservatives generally have said, here's the rules. I'll abide by him or I'll get out. What what made our situation exceptional was people on the left saying, I know what's the rules. I don't like him, and I'm not leaving. And, and I'm there's not no political them. will to change it. There's no political will to make the hard decisions. See, I, I, I will go with this, Jeff, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is it. The crisis in the United Methodist Church is as much caused by conservatives going <sighs> than liberals pushing an agenda. If a conservative stepped up, which, again, until disaffiliations occurred, we had the numbers, mm -hmm. stepped up and said, no, this is not how it's going to go. If yeah. you don't like it, there's a door we sure appreciate. Love you. Jesus loves you. Hope see you in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> that would be how it would work. Mm -hmm. But because conservatives have, and again, I don't want to beat up my old tribe, but sometimes you're going to tell the truth no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The attitude is just, please don't hit me. Yeah, I've been doing I've, – I've done two episodes now. I've got a series I'm doing called uh, Bitter Medicine where I do talk to conservatives about their own failings in this equation. And I think the fair speech is to say some have been willing and ready to go to war, not enough, and, and others haven't followed them. And so often there's been friendly fire from conservatives saying, hey, we need to be winsome. We need to be loving. I really don't like this guy speaking boldly and strongly over here. That's mean-spirited. I'm not with him. I'm one of the good conservatives. You can work with me. But at, <laughs> but in saying that, yeah. again. They shot it all in the foot. Appeasement is yeah. the sincere belief that the tiger will eat you last. That, that, that is exa exactly the case. If they're willing to treat me badly mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be gone, mm -hmm. <laughs> why aren't they going to be when, – at what point do they go, well, now we'll treat the good conservatives well? Yeah. There's, so I know some of these conservatives who – they got to this point around disaffiliation and they met all this um, opposition from the conference. All of a sudden, their uh, other clergy that they've worked alongside for decades are speaking ill of them, and they're going, I was just naive. I really thought that they would be good to me whenever it came 
to this point, um, there is this sort of denial on the part of conservatives that that trusts in the rationality and goodwill of uh, people on the left. And I'm not going to say there's there's none of that on the left, but I am going to say that we we have when when all of a sudden the chips are down, people take sides and they become partisans, and they really don't have this ability to self reflect and go, is my side behaving well right now? And um, I don't know how many people are going to be able to come back from that and go, things got. I got crazy. I got really mean. You know, I, I really was unnecessarily cruel in this situation. That's not that, that's that's the thing is that once people become partisan, yeah, the truth does not matter as much. Yeah, I and, and what I mean by that is, let me tell you what I'm going to go back to Arkansas with. Um, this is me being ambitious. I'm going on this podcast to lift up Jason's name. That so someday. In the history of Methodism, there's never been over a six-foot bishop, I don't think. I'm going to be elected bishop because of this or some okay. other just absolute I don't know idea that's out there mm -hmm. that says that he's not standing up just for principle. He's got his own agenda. Well, my agenda is I want a fair conference in 10 days. That's just, what I want. I think I heard you wrong. I thought you said you were coming on here for your own self-aggrandizement oh, well, and yeah. bishop, but it's the and opposite. T-shirts, my T-shirts are on sale right now at shop.com. <laughs> but no, you're here for the sake of principle, not exactly. for the sake of a future office. It will be very easy to just bend a knee. It would be very easy just to bend a knee. I've lost friends over this. Yeah, people, like I said, for 15 years, my colleagues, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and again, you know. I am not the cookie cutter looking pastor. I'm easy to make fun of. <laughs> I'm easy to ridicule. I'm easy to do these things with. Mm -hmm. But the truth will be the truth no matter what they do. And yeah. what I've told conservatives, and I'm sorry, but yeah, go ahead. What, what I've told conservatives is if they're going to hang it a sinner anyway, do the sin. <laughs> if they're going to, if they're going to call you, if they're going to call you all these names, if they're mm -hmm. going to tell you that this is about ambition, this is about all this other stuff, and you've done none of it, yeah. that you're completely and utterly innocent of all their charges, then you staying quiet doesn't eliminate the charge. Well, just if it's a uh, the the so I I'm thinking I know I know. Yeah. First Peter says, if you get punished for evil doing, what good is that to you? Rather. It is a credit to you when you suffer for doing rightly, right. and because that that is the ministry of Christ Jesus, who right. who also committed no sin but suffered at the hands of sinners, and that's the the ministry that that I shouldn't use the word sin. It's an expression I've heard a gajillion times. It's not. I'm not trying to be theological in the word sin. If you do the crime, yeah. if they're going to hang you for the crime, right, you might as well do it. Yeah. If you're going to receive the same punishment for it, if yeah. they're going to accuse you of it anyway. So what, what conservatives have been unwilling to entertain is that – so we all agree that enemies are going to speak evil of us for loving and following Christ. What we haven't been prepared to consider is those enemies can not only be in the church but can run the church. Mm -hmm. And so whenever there are people running the church who are in influential positions who are deeply offended by us and angry with us, there's this um, well-intentioned – but um, not helpful tendency to go, maybe I am the bad guy. Maybe I need to check myself. Maybe I need to be silent. There isn't a side going in, – in a lot of people's heads going, well, it must mean I'm doing something right. If, if people that are aligned against the gospel hate me, then it must mean I'm doing something right. right. There is not that voice because for so long being a good Christian in the United Methodist Church, whether you're a liberal or conservative, has meant being nice and people feeling – loved and affirmed by you. There is a through the looking glass attitude or idea that strikes people mm -hmm. once they really see it. I'll be nice. You'll be nice. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not nice, but I was nice. Mm -hmm. I'll be non-confrontational. So you'll be non-confrontational. Well, you were confrontational. Mm -hmm. I was non-confrontational. Why didn't that uphold? Right. Tea parties aren't supposed to make sense, Alice. <laughs> I mean, that's how this is. In this world and in this time, rules for thee, none for me. Yeah, so a liberal watching this, though, would go, 
conservatives have been so mean for so long. They've been spreading misinformation. They've been saying hateful things Show about, it. huh? Show it. Yeah. Show it. Prove it. Yeah. Th- th- that's my issue. Yeah. It's a both sides thing. Then show me yeah. the other side, yeah. and I'll be the first to condemn it. Yeah. Give it to me, and I'll be the first one there. If you know, in churches where people make this too much about you know homosexuality and how that makes them feel, so forth and so on, I'm the first to correct it. This isn't the issue. Yeah. The issue is how we deal with it theologically, but not how we deal with the people. Mm-hmm. The people should be treated well. The people should be treated loving. The people should be given grace. Yeah, yeah, but. No, it's the same. It's not the same. I don't have an Arkansas page where I can kick people off and recruit vehemently. Yeah. I am curious what the response will be on this when I'm done because I'm supposed to not recruit anybody. And I'm not recruiting anybody. I'm telling you the situation as I see it. Well, and I don't think – one of the things that's been repeatedly misconstrued is conservatives don't want people to leave the United Methodist Church if it's a good fit for them. Absolutely. They don't want them to join other bodies if they're leaning left and they're going to drag those bodies left. It doesn't serve anybody for liber- happily liberal congregations and clergy to leave the United Methodist Church. We don't want that. We, what we want is an honest, above-the-table conversation about – where congregations need to be affiliated to glorify God and to be happily in covenant with other churches. And to make disciples. What I want, and this is the the problem in, in November started from the jump of the bishop's sermon, which is about, you know, basically lamentation about how bad this is and so forth mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah. And I never understood why the bishop didn't get up. Go, you know, there was this guy named Paul. It was this guy named Barnabas. Mm -hmm. They disagreed over one guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they separated. And how much more work of the kingdom of God was done when they separated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of being so in love with an institution. Right. To be in love with the mission enough to go, if they disagree, we're not going to fight. Well, and you saw my reporting on Bishop Mueller's demeanor and his words. It seemed clear to me that he was uh, emotionally manipulating the assembly in order to... Uh, be more emotional, more reactive, more upset than I, I think he could have done the opposite. I think he could have uh, shown confidence in God and rejoiced that that there was a discernment where people were were being sifted. Um, I, I I saw more, you know, I, I can't speak to Bishop Mueller's intent, but I can say that whenever the leader of a group publicly emotes that makes a a, a strong bid, for people to identify with that. And so if you intentionally, well, they did that in Oklahoma too, intentionally facilitated a spirit of lamentation. We we had a whole liturgy that um, validated anger, resentment. Um, we actually had an explicit reference to breaking uh, glass in the streets and screaming at injustice. Um, when, you, when you summon those words in that spirit in the midst of a group, uh, you really can't be surprised whenever there's bad behavior and division and dissension. And then you bring forward what the call of the conference is. Mm -hmm. This is not about somebody's email. This is about the paperwork that is done Mm -hmm. before us, the work of the trustees to approve it. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about paperwork. We're talking about somebody's email. And he'd say, you were right. And then he'd say, but you can vote any way you want to. Which, of course, is true, but uh, it's, it's an open invitation to make it about something that it's not about. Right. The call of the conference, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that if we were more, if I felt that there was more help in Arkansas, there's a judicial ruling to be made on that entire conference. The call of the conference is this. That means that your vote should deal with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, I mean, the hypocrisy in that maybe is 2553 was written explicitly for people who don't like the current language of the uh, book of Discipline, but the vast majority of churches using it are perfectly happy with the language in, in the Book of Discipline. Action. Those are, that's the key word yeah. of why this is for both sides. It's also about the in action yeah. of the conference. So you have to squint to see it, but you can see it. Right. It, but but the clear intent of that was assuming that the traditional plan would be adopted and enforced, and that that some people couldn't couldn't abide by it. So we would graciously let right. them out. 
And Praise that was, God for the word in actions. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there was the intent, and then there was the word that that made it so that conservatives could squeak out a few squint. Right. But still, there's there's the explicit purpose of things, and then there's what it's actually used for, and it's not always the same. Right. And if people didn't squint on that one, then conservatives would quite literally be trapped in a denomination because they outlawed 28, 2548.2. Which right. had previously been used for disaffiliation. If there was a fair process, Arkansas could have seen a judicial ruling, but there wasn't. There's not going to be. Right. And and therein lies the thing. Um, I want to get to a couple things, and then I want to. Well, get I know to we need to talk about Central United Methodist, but okay. I, I wanted to. I, I don't know what you had on your plate, but I need to make sure that we talk about the current setting Absolutely. of Arkansas. What has transpired since last year? Um, what what is happening as you're going into the next special called conference? So, um, the current situation in Arkansas is that if all paperwork is done correctly and through, mm-hmm. which is a been a kind of a slog, but the trustees have done a fine job trying to get through this. I'm, I'm not. The problem is if you mention somebody in a, in this setting, is this I'm being critical? I'm not. It's just a slog. If if we can get everybody's paperwork done, there'll be near 60 churches ready to go come a week from this Saturday. Oh, wow. It's coming close, yeah. Um, so now the question is, what will our new bishop do? Yeah, uh, Paget Is that her no, name? No, uh, Merrill. Merrill, Bishop Merrill. Laura Merrill? Yep. Okay, excuse me. She's, uh, she's a new bishop, and in a lot of ways she says the things that we want to hear. Um, she already called an October conference that's going to be a two-hour Zoom meeting. Well, there's no way you can have a real fight on a two-hour sure. Zoom meeting. Right, this is yeah. just going to kind of get through. Yeah. But on the same day that she announced that, she set the same rules for May 13th. And the same rules start with the idea we'll vote over everybody over 80%. Now, here's the thing with those rules. They have to be approved by the conference. Mm-hmm. So are we just putting up the old rules just as a starting spot to have something on a website? Yeah. Or is this the belief of where we're going to be? I do not believe, I, I believe that Bishop Merrill is a fair person. Mm-hmm. And the reason I drove to Oklahoma from Nilla, Arkansas is basically to say, that's all we're looking for. Fairness. Fairness. Yeah. Now, what's happened in other spots in Arkansas is not an attitude of fairness. Now, I'm not going to mention names. I'm not going to bow up because, basically because I would make other people uncomfortable. But there's a church in northwest Arkansas where the DS basically looked at the pastor of that church who had just got out at 69% and looked at him and said, good luck, whether you'll get out or not. This was after the church vote, not after After the... the church conference vote. Okay. Good luck on whether you get out or not. That same church, they wheeled in people from the nursing home to get there. The same church allowed a member of the conference staff to participate with the stay side in writing the stay side speech. Okay. And was allowed to participate while the vote was going on. They didn't get to vote. Okay. But they were there to rally troops. Yeah. How, as an elder in the conference, am I allowed to be at somebody else's church conference? Let alone being on payroll by the people in this room where the majority, the super majority of the room, said, we would like to leave, and that person's still in the room. Yeah, so how, how, how pervasive do you think it's been that the conference allows this process to go through, and yet there's a finger on the scale. Over and over and over again. Church after church after church. Again, um, I will be leading the floor effort for those who just be disaffiliating. And my issue was... Your three churches, how many of them are appearing before the annual conference? All three of my churches will be going there, but they're unanimous... 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Okay. They couldn't find anybody to be a state person in any yeah. of those. There's no fight to be had. Okay. Will they bring me up? Will they allow you to speak on the floor? Well, no, they'll let me speak on the floor. I'm an yeah. elder, so forth and so on. Will they 
intentionally go after my churches on some snag or issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For it to pass and go on, yes. But will it be brought up? It will. Because there are people who have issues against me. You know. Being here, Jeff, is an idea to go, I don't care if you hit me. I mean, that's just a reality. Yeah, I had that anxiety as my churches appeared before the conference. I, I thought maybe someone would muster some resentment towards me and no they were so distracted by the other big churches leaving they didn't exactly. have any energy for me i have so. smaller churches too and i don't figure it'll be an issue but i've also warned my crew because i'm my thing is i'm calling anybody who's kevin who's this philly in arkansas bring your church to the conference let yeah. them see you yeah, yeah. let them under because the jonesboro thing nobody saw that they brought in the jonesboro people to sit in the back in red shirts what if all of the rest of Jonesboro was there and said, we want to leave? What well, would the attitude towards that be? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's just not how these things have worked so far. So one of the things that you've established, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of people from other conferences who are watching, what is there to be learned? One of the things is um, the when you're looking at who has organization, when you're looking at who is good at being public and loud, it's almost uniformly left. Absolutely. You know? I'm I'm about to report on Auburn UMC in uh, Alabama West Florida. They uh, uh, couldn't even vote. the The conference would not let them vote, and so now their organized effort is just leaving in mass. That's what conservatives do. Conservatives don't stay and get nasty. And you know, Rob Renfro of Good News Magazine wrote about this all as a cage fight. He said conservatives don't want to do a cage fight. Let us out of the cage, and if you don't let us out of the cage with our buildings, we'll leave the cage individually. Uh, as a group. So, um, the see, and I, I respect Rob and I respect all those folks. Yeah. But I was taught, and again, I'm, I'm a poor boy from Pickett, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I was taught long ago if someone's a bully, you know what the best answer to bully is? Jesus loves them. Best bounce to bully is let them swing and bust them right in the nose. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want a cage fight either. Mm hmm. But if you're gonna put me in one, you're gonna lie me in one. You're gonna have to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to do it. Yeah. And, and and there's this thing of we'll just leave. And again, I'm not opposed to the attitude of we'll just leave. If you can't win, don't don't fight. Yeah. But if you can win, fight. Yeah. Yeah. That's been the thing that's discouraging. Is hypothetically the numbers are in place for conservatives to win, but they just don't want to fight. You know? Exactly. So it's there are different answers to what is to be done right now, and depending on what annual conference you're in, depending on who your allies are, I think I, I really admire a lot of conservatives who are staying to serve as a consistent witness and warn those who are leading it in a far extreme direction. But I also, you know, I I chose to disaffiliate because I I saw what I think is writing on the wall at jurisdictional conferences across America. And uh, I think there's a liberal takeover where they hold all the levers of power and are not only not going to have pity on people like me, but going to enjoy using the levers of power against people like me. May will become shall. Yeah. You can do it will become you will do it. Because let's take just yeah. a minute to look at what the future looks like. And this is what I've been trying to tell Arkansans and everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was told I do this from a position of fear. And my answer to that is fear mongering. Right. Yeah. The the answer to that is if there's a tornado, yeah. is it fear mongering to go yeah. get in the tornado shelter? Yeah. There's yeah. a hurricane, is it fear mongering to go yeah. leave? Yeah. Yeah. This is what this is just basic facts. Yeah. 2024 conference is not the 2024 conference. It is the 2020 20. conference. Yeah. The numbers of delegates will not increase on the African side from what happened in right. 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Throw this in. Now, conferences like Texas conferences are some of the most progressive conferences in the country. And the they get to replace left, yeah. every one of those delegates. Yeah. I've had our discussions with folks on the, con on the general conference level that say 43% is the traditional vote now. And it's soft. Yeah. Yeah. So it's why be hard, yeah. wouldn't they 
change the language when that happens. Well, in Minnesota, they've already changed their conference's language to if you as a clergy don't feel good about performing a gay wedding, then you shall uh, connect Find with somebody it. else to do it. For yeah. You. So that's that's the wiggle so room in, in words, between right now. You don't have to sin. You just have to have somebody else sin on your behalf. Yeah. You have to connect people so they can sin. Right. The thing I know that I, I wanted to see your response about, because when we originally talked, there were a number of Arkansas churches that were potentially interested in going public about the ways in which the conference was putting its hand on the scales um, and behaving very inappropriately in the midst of these churches trying to navigate their way out. I, I got to read a, doc, a document from one church in which uh, there were speakers from the conference, other elders from other uh, churches that came in and openly scoffed at traditionalists and their their way of uh, reading scripture and their way of navigating the current situation. Um, I ended up uh, speaking with one person in their church that was maybe interested, in, and then they they got together and decided, no, we don't want to go public. We uh, we we don't know about this, and so you're here. It, right. This started off me and you talking uh, five, six, seven churches. Mm -hmm. They all backed down. Um, so I, I wanted to invite your sharing any of those details that are normal in those situations, but also um, invite your commentary on why it is that so few, I mean, this is something that's pervasive across your annual conference. It's probably affected dozens, if not more than a hundred churches right. of open, openly hateful and biased uh, response to their sincere convictions. Why do you think that they've been so reluctant to be public about it? So start come back to that, but first off, is there any specifics of things done by the conference that are just normal and that you've heard time and time again that you think is helpful for a viewer in another conference to know about? If a church is too big, whatever that number is, mm -hmm. there's a stopping in their process. Arbitrary stopping of their process. If there seems to be momentum built on this, the disaffiliation side, there's an immediate stopping of their process. If the vote doesn't go that way, if somebody got their feelings hurt in a listening session, which is session number two of the three, I don't know how we do it in Oklahoma. We have, have a compulsory three sessions. Right. Now. Okay. A bishop or not, excuse me, a district superintendent meets with you the first time. You have a stay speaker and a disaffiliation speaker for the second time. You have final questions and a straw poll to ask for the church conference in the third meeting. Oh now, you can have more meetings. And they're big on more meetings. I'm about to get to that. But if somebody got their feelings hurt or somebody got, was hateful or some act of misinformation, which, again, please show me where it is. Yeah. Yeah. They never, there's no standard of that. Something will stop the process. The other side is, is that if it, they feel that it is too GMC heavy, they will get more speakers for the stay side and there'll be no other voice. There will be a special extra meeting where a stay speaker is allowed to speak. Cause remember the past, I see, I don't know what other people go through, but this is a system that we have. Yeah. And the pastor decides who the speakers are. Okay. Well, if that speaker on the, on the stay side, wasn't firing brimstone enough, we go find somebody else who was. Yeah. And we only determine that after they have went up against the disaffiliation speaker and see how well they've done. I mean, I got I got several a funny story on that, but I don't know if you want to go into that. But, but they, uh, you know, there were those who were not prepared to be stay speakers in some of these some of these churches. Okay. And they did not do well. And what happens is immediately we bring somebody else in who's the standard bare large church intellectual better speaker. Yeah. And, you know, and then you go through that process. The other side is that we've consistently seen, again, rules for thee, none for me. Um, all of a sudden, district superintendents can tell you who the membership of a, of a congregation is. Hmm. You know the discipline. Who's in charge of the membership of the congregation? The elder. The elder. The one appointed to that church. Yeah. Take thou authority. Yeah. But now... I know of a, a case where um, someone was off the conference rolls for three charge conferences. You understand to get off the conference rolls, yeah. it's it's work. Yeah. You got to want to. There's got to be some spite on that end of. I do not want to be part of this group no more. Yeah. They were allowed just back in. Here's your vote. Here's your ballot. That's weird. Mm -hmm. And in the cases I'm telling you, 
they still cleared it. So a frustration you and I have is that uh, oftentimes allegations are made without names or dates or specifics attached. Right. Are there any names or dates or specifics attached to anything specific uh, in this milieu? Uh, or do you think it just has to stay unnamed, nonspecific, because you don't want to get anybody in trouble? Here's the thing. There's an argument in all those churches mm -hmm. of if we keep our head down, maybe they'll let us out. Right. And Arkansas did target before. I came into the door. I have lists of papers in my car that will be used on the annual conference floor. And by the way, uh, May 13th, I'm sure it'll be online somewhere. Come on, watch. It'll be yeah. big fun. Yeah. Um, I have lists of what happened, things happened, because when people have false allegations, I'm going to give them the truth. Here it is. Yeah. Bullet point by bullet point. That's what I'm going to use my speaking to do. Yeah. Because that way you have an opportunity. If it's just emotional, then it's just emotional. Yeah. You know, but but the, the thing is, is that my prayer, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm here, is to make a plea that that is not how this goes. Yeah, yeah. For some reason there, I mean, I know of, I will say this, there is a conservative district superintendent in the Southwest District who has fully bought into the institution and yeah. has become completely unfair yeah. on how she does dealings with churches who wish to disaffiliate. Now, is that because there's pressure on a conference level? I don't know. I really don't. And anything me telling you that I think it is, is doing what they're doing. I have no, I have no way of understanding that. Yeah. I do know of a, a pastor named Katie Birchfield. Who uh, who did leave? Who got to leave in November? But one of her churches didn't, and in that church, she was told what not to preach. The DS came and told her not to preach anything on sin, or redemption, or anything to this effect. It should not be preaching that during this time. So is she is she still UMC? Well, she's GMC now. But she's preaching at a UMC church. She was at Tadime, yes. See, and there's the other side, Jeff, and, and this is this is the larger thing. There have been more po local pastors leave than elders. Sure, yeah. That is some guts. Because they could pull their credential, they could pull them from that church like that. Yeah. There's no hold of them. There's no guaranteed appointment on right. their side. Yeah. They have to deal with me. Yeah. I've done nothing to violate the discipline. They have to deal with me. Yeah. They have to deal with you. I'm You're a different. local licensed pastor. Well, okay. All right. Well, I mean, that's, but, but that's. I was. I'm right. out now. Right. But there's that idea that they have to deal with the elders. Yeah. It is elders who need to step up because unless I violate the discipline in some way, yeah. they can't come get me. Well, and even if they do, there's a right to a trial. Right. Um, and due process. The oh, and please. Local licensed pastors please, don't have that. Please, my friend, bring me a trial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, we'll see what happens. I I, I certainly I hope you don't get in trouble. I, I don't suspect think that's the case. they see it coming, right? And they're ready for you. And uh, again, what I will be, yeah. what I will be when this is done is I am an ambitious pastor who's leaving because I haven't been appointed right, that I haven't done something right, that I'm jealous of other pastors. Yeah, this is all an ambitious move on my part, so forth and so on. And I'm like, well, um. I'm leaving three churches to add up to 150 to go to a church that's got 150. Woohoo! Look at my ambition go. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the responses of churches that didn't make it through, and that would be Central Fayetteville. Do you want to come back to the line of questioning around why uh, churches are reluctant to, to speak out about this? Oh, okay. This? Well, let me, yeah, let me, let's deal with that. Okay. Reluctance is local pastors, they can pull you out today. Yeah. Elders are reluctant because they could just move you. Yeah. And it starts all over again. Yeah. The argument that does not hold water of why Jonesboro, Searcy, and Cabot were picked on is because the pastor was too involved in the process. Yeah. And so I know pastors who have been thoroughly mistreated who are wanting their mouth, wanting things, them to be left out of it. Yeah. There is a chilling effect of, well, we'll just go after you. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. They're going to go after you anyway. 
but there is an attitude on there of maybe if we keep our head down, it won't get that big, be that big of an issue. They know it's wrong. And here's the funny thing. In that Southwest church I was talking about, and you spoke to them, their pastor, um, I, think, I don't think he had a problem with this. He's about to retire. He is as theologically conservative as we are. Uh-huh. But he's about to retire. Yeah. They won't change. His language is they won't change the language before I get out of here. Huh. And so he didn't really push this church to that, but it started to grow. What happened was is they sent the wrong people to speak on the stay side. Four of them. <laughs> oh, my. And each time the intellectual better attitude showed up and the numbers for disaffiliation went up. Went up. Yeah. This was going to be close. And at their church conference, it was 75%. Yeah. yeah. And that was 75%. What they know, I the, the lady I spoke with, they, they knew 10 to 15 more didn't make the bit, didn't make the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the thing is, you know, I don't I don't think they understand how they come off. I don't. I don't think they understand how this looks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they see it as them defending something. Sure. But if it's that great, why does it need this level of defense? <laughs> or if, if it's that great, then why are people running from it? And then, so, I mean, the, the thing that's the self-reinforcing, just crazy thing is they, they say people are leaving because of misinformation. We need to give them better information. They step in and personally deliver it and it chases people away more. Right. And then their only option is to either self-reflect and go, man, what we have must not be as appealing to other people as it is to me. You either go there or you go, they're getting even more misinformation well, from it's some. The evil pastor, yeah. the evil whatever. The-, it's a, the, the GMC speaker, you know, a lot of conferences have said no speakers from anyone other than the UMC. Right. You know? That's what happened in Arkansas. Yeah. That's what doubled the amount of speaking dates I got, to be honest with you. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm because, you know, a lot of our leaders went out in the first wave. Yeah. So now it's, you know, here we stand. Yeah. 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 There's when we're looking at what is keeping conservatives quiet, I think there, there are two extreme kinds of people. One are just looking for a fight, they just love fighting. They're like sociopaths. I don't know. And then there are people that are really deep empaths and they just hate ever offending anybody or having anyone angry at them. And it causes them just great relational pain whenever they have made somebody angry. And pastors really have to be in the middle here right. where we are not so moved by people's feelings that we refrain from the truth. Uh, but we're also not just just gunning for a fight. You know, we're, we're willing to fight. You know, we're compared to shepherds. You know, poimen in the Greek means shepherd, also translated as pastor. Right. And a shepherd defends the sheep. A shepherd fights off the wolves and cares for the sheep. It's a carrot and stick position. Right. And yet we want to imagine that we can do right with only carrot and no stick. And when it comes time to use the stick, so many blink. And that's when the integrity of one's leadership and one's faith, I think, is on the line. And so many do not pass that trial. And rather than own up to it, they want people to just say, shucks, nothing to be done. Right. You know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And then people like me and you uh, are, are sometimes politely, sometimes not saying, uh, no, you could fight. Right. There, but, there are other options here. But before I became a pastor, like I said, I was in politics and, and things to this effect. I used to write negative ads for candidates. That just tells you what the nature of old Jason was. Okay. <laughs> there are times when I, I do a really good job of keeping old nature, old Jason nature and down and so forth and so on. But there are times, and I've had these conversations with God and basically said, okay, you called all of me into this, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if you've called all of me into this, is it time to go back to that old well mm. and draw from it to do this fight? To do it with love, to do it, with a quest for peace, Mm -hmm. but to say, if you're going to hit me, you're going to have to. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the other side. It's a bully. Bullies don't want fights. They don't want to be in that cage any more than you do. But you've got to be willing to take the licks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that they know they're going to have to. Yeah. 
Yeah. And most time, they won't want to. Yeah, it's really hard going through that actual, you know, I wonder how it has sat in their stomachs as they block the disaffiliations of three churches and they've seen the fallout from that. I wonder how many of them who voted that way went, I'm really glad I voted that way. I just love everything that's come out of this. And I wonder how many have gone, didn't go the way I wanted it to. I really don't. The hope. Here's the thing. I have three arguments for the floor that I'm going to use. Number one, this is not the place to re-adjudicate a church conference. Mm -hmm. If it needs to be re-adjudicated and the district superintendent needs to be doing it, then yeah. if it's got this far, yeah. these are fairly elected people to this moment who've got checks in their pockets to give you. Yeah, yeah. One. Yeah. Two, I don't care what 67.1 is. It's a super majority. If it was 50.1, you might have an argument. Yeah. 50 plus one person, you might have an argument. This is 67% plus one person. That's a super majority. Yeah. How close you got to that line doesn't matter. It's the line that matters. Yeah. And number three, what do you think happens when this is done? Yeah. You vote no. Yeah. You think everybody's just going to go, well, we're United Methodist. Yeah. No. When's the next apportionment check? Can't yeah. wait to pay it. <laughs> yeah. How many, how many, how many after the first round where you held back Jonesboro, Searcy, and Cabot, how many seriously think it's going to go a good direction if they do that again? You know, the, on the on the chopping block, the sixty that are coming before the conference. Do you have an idea of how many of those are big enough that they might want to fight for? Five, five. Okay, so those. That would be my guess. There will be five on the table. Four, if one doesn't. Uh, as of the time of this recording, there is one who will go in the process, and I promise you, they will go after it if they get sixty-seven percent. But there are five. Um, one, and it's, it's to be. I think I can say this one because. It was a church in central Arkansas that didn't have a stay side, didn't have whatever. They went through the process. Everybody was fair. Everybody was loving. They've already said they're not suing. They're not doing anything no matter what. And it just the line they hit was 67 on the nose. No way. Exactly. Did you say the name of the church? Greenbrier. Greenbrier. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Six, I mean, again. That's a tough squeeze. The, U, the DS said the process was fair. Yeah, the pastor said the process, and talking to the pastor, and again, I'm looking for stories. Yeah, and he's like, <laughs> "It happened yeah. exactly, fairly the way it was supposed to." And, and Greenbrier is not one of those big ones, is it? It's kind of big. It's so, not, do you think they'll fight it? Sixty-seven on the nose. So, you think they will? You think it'll get to if the four annual find, conference? And... If, if they can find something, okay. Now, again, the thing is, is that 67 on the nose, you know, one person sick, one person wasn't. Yeah. Who wasn't there. Yeah. It gives you, I mean, again, if this was a floor fight about the church conference, 67 on the nose is one to go after. Yeah. But it was so fair. Sure. It, the system was worked exactly the way it was supposed to, and this is just how it turned out. That's the margin, yeah. And, you know, the pastor there isn't a firebrand in any way, shape, matter, or form. The DS would probably be looking for something and can't find anything. Well, so we'll see what happens. So we'll see we'll what We'll know happens. what to look for right. in a couple weeks. So I mean, the other ones, there was some hostility. There was an organized stay group. There was <laughs> there was those things. Yeah. That, that sat out in, in the realm, and in this one, it just really isn't the case. Okay, okay. So what else What else about Arkansas? What, what's, what's helpful for people outside of Arkansas to know? What, what do you think would be galvanizing and encouraging and uh, faithful to, to say to your brethren if I they watch this? I don't know. For The first thing is this. Bishop Merrill, we just want it to be fair. We don't want to have a fight. I want to sit down and then I want to go, you know, grab me a corned beef sandwich down the road. This is a good day. You don't know Hot Springs famous for their corned beef sandwiches, but I just I just want this to be fair. I want to be yeah. an honest vote, an honest deal. These people have reached the level they're supposed to. They've done what you asked. If it if there's an issue, let's take an hour to discuss that issue. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But if there's not an issue enough to have an open floor, an open conference with lots of speakers and lots of evidence, then let them go. Yeah. Let them go. You're not going to keep them anyway. What I would tell you is, is that 
if you're in another conference, don't become this polarized. Do what you got to do yeah. to become this polarized. This starts in, I think it was 2017, with a female pastor walkout, and it has never healed since. What's that story? The uh, Wesley Wesleyan Covenant Foundation or Covenant Association in Arkansas put together a proposal. You remember the amendment that failed in 2016 against female pastors? I don't even remember exactly remember what the now. basis was of it. It failed because it was there wasn't a lot of information on it, and it got through, and a lot of female clergy got their feelings hurt over it. And what this was I, something particular to your annual conference or something that the general, general conference, conference the general conference put together a, a uh, an amendment or a resolution on yeah. female pastors yeah and a lot of times people just folk know on everything because sure. that's what they do and it yeah. failed i do kind of remember right? this so this was a kick in the teeth to female pastors and so after trying to give a special resolution to basically affirm our belief in the traditional plan which failed as an appeasement kind of resolution, we put together one supporting women pastors in ministry. Okay. Well, some of the female pastors got up and basically beat us over the head with stereotype. Well, you've never supported women ministry pastors, and they walk out. Ever the female pastors in the floor of the annual conference left. All of them, or how? All the female pastors left. Vast majority. Because they said they had never been supported, that they that that this that this resolution was an insult to them, and that we should always have been supported in ministry, and they walked out. Yikes! Oh, it's it gets worse. So they walk out, and we 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 had this this big fight. And by the way, it didn't go well for them as far as how delegates looked at it or anything to that effect. But the thing what happened is is that the guy who wrote the resolution, who was just trying to be pleasant, unfortunately passed away two days later. Mm. And he was very visibly upset. He dies of a heart attack two days later. Mm. And lots of people haven't let that go. They, they blame his death on the reaction of the female clergy? Yeah, because he couldn't understand it. He was... He was just trying to do something nice. Yeah, when you do something with good intentions and it's met with hostility and resentment, it's very distressing. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I seen Tom that day, and you know, he was crushed. And again, so in most annual con, well, I, I would be surprised. Now again, he had health issues, so forth and sure. so on, so yeah, forth and so. But there just, is just this. There's just been this wave, and maybe somewhat unfairly, that this contributed to it. Okay. And yeah. since then, there has been hostility. Do not allow the stay people or the disaffiliation people to be this polarized. The reason it's happening in Arkansas is because this polarization occurred. There was no punishment to the female pastors. The conservatives look at it as we were trying to be pleasant to you, and this is what you did to us. That leads into the election of delegates. That leads into all of it. That's how Arkansas became what it is. And it's why the, uh, the conditions are right for this fight. Yeah. In other conferences, you love the people you're with. You understand there might be hostility towards it. And a lot of folks don't like it. Mm -hmm. But to the end of the day, everybody can muscle up and go. They want to go, let them go. In Arkansas, it's taken as a personal affront. Don't create boogeymen. There are none. We're all broken. We're all fallen. We're all sinners in need of Christ's grace. We can agree agreeably. Or we can disagree agreeably, yeah. We can disagree agreeably. And at the end of the day, you want things to go well for both sides. I want there to be a strong United Methodist Church when this is all said and done. Yeah. That makes disciples for Jesus Christ who disagree with me on this issue. At the end of the day, I'll let the Lord handle it. Yeah. If their grace was better than my grace, I'll seek repentance for it. Yeah. Yeah. But if not, I still want those people to receive that grace. Yeah. I still want there to be a thriving United Methodist Church. But the fight makes you better. 
and bitterness is against the grace of God. I think that's a good closing exhortation. Um, for anyone who watched, I uh, just want to exhort you. I've, I've done reports on West Virginia and Great Plains Annual Conference where they have seemingly gotten along quite well. Um, Great Plains uh, was very gracious in its terms of letting churches disaffiliate. West Virginia, I haven't reported on this yet, but it would seem that they're also being quite gracious. They're not using 2553. They're using 2549, and they're um, requiring the bare minimum on the way out, and it's it's much easier. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll double check that to make sure I'm speaking accurately, but not every annual conference is as hostile and um, partisan as Arkansas has become, as a worry. Uh, my old conference, Oklahoma, is becoming... Um, there are groups that are behaving better than some of the other groups, and it's good to look at them. It's, it's good to look at what you don't want to be and, and to look at the hostility and the resentment in some places, but it's also good to look at uh, examples of places that are doing well. So maybe I'll try and get somebody from Kansas in uh, the room with me and, and form a kind of a counterbalance. But uh, let's be in prayer for Jason as he closes out ministry with these three churches and with this annual conference. And uh, let's be in prayer for the Arkansas Annual Conference as they gather in a couple weeks. Uh, let, let's pray that they have a much more amenable and respectful time than last time. So thanks for joining me. This has been Plain Spoken. If you like this, go ahead and share it, recommend it. Um, share it in particular with anybody who's just wanting to get the lay of the land. Um, and if, if you know somebody who's been going through a hard time in a local church who's, who's had some heavy-handed leadership, send it to them so that they know they're not alone. Um, Jason had a good closing reflection, and then I think the closing exhortation was, if you are in hostile waters, uh, is there any, any exhortation you'd like to give? If you're going to do, if they're going to hang you, if you're going to hang you a criminal, do the crime. Stand up. Don't bend the knee. Bend in the knee. Got us where we are. Jason Sutphin, be bold in the Lord. That's how Amen. I would sum that up. Absolutely. All right. This has been Plain Spoken. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you later.